we presented the, the idea of the state operator map. And we tried, we, we, we found that we could match states and operators where all the states built out of the vacuum by your, with oscillators. But we are st starting to wonder what sort of operator would be related to states with momentum. So which operator can I insert in the plane that will give me a state with momentum in, on the cylinder? Now, um, see, roughly speaking, if you want to create a state of momentum P from the vacuum, can do something like that almost by definition where x is the zero mode of the scalar field I'm gonna put hats here and there today because uh, otherwise there will be infinite confusion between P the uh, again value and P the operator so roughly speaking we would like to find an operator with the property that as I send this operator uh, to the to the very path on the cylinder. Perhaps by normalizing by something, I will get The same way as uh, yesterday, we found used tricks like this. So this factor was used to convert this into, into the Z. And this uh, expression was the reason we said that A1, minus one inserted at the, acting on the, on the past ground state, would match the ZX inserted at the origin in the plane. So, roughly speaking, we want an operator with a property that, that it behaves like this. It should be an operator which starts like this. And then perhaps there's other stuff which either is killed by sending tau to minus infinity or is killed by acting on the vacuum. The simplest thing I can try to do is to define an operator because this is a zero mode of the scalar field. I can try to define an operator like this. So roughly speaking, if I, I have not really defined this operator, but if I could define it reasonably, uh, when act on the vacuum, the zero mode would transform the vacuum to P. The positive modes would kill of X would kill the vacuum, and the negative mode would be killed by sending that to minus infinity. So can we make sense of this operator? Now, if you're looking at things like powers of X, we know we can define them by things like point splitting, you know, or normal ordering. So roughly, roughly a way to define this operator might be to just expand it in powers of P and define carefully each power of x with subtractions. Uh, there is an alternative way which is often useful for calculations, which is just to insert this expression in the path integral and see what comes, about, what comes out. Uh, 
in previous lectures, I only worked on the ceiling on the cylinder and sort of left calculations on the plane for uh, for homework. But here I want to do both because they are both instructive in different ways. So suppose you have some part integral. It could be on the plane. It could be on some other manifold. I don't care. I have my free boson action. And I want to insert an operator like that. Because this is an exponential, essentially what I'm doing is I'm adding something else to the action. I'm adding IP x evaluated at some point. Actually, I can insert even several of these operators. And possibly write that as, a, as an integral on, on my manifold. Notice this i is not the same as this i. I'm sorry. Because of my fault. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you, well, I, I assume when you multiply that operator, like you're trying to take the um, expectation value of it, but do you have issues in the fact that the x doesn't commute with the action? It's about integral. That those are numbers, they're not operators anymore. So that's one advantage of doing things with path integral. Everything you do inside a path integral is just manipulations of numbers. Operators come about if you start slicing your path integral. Uh, and uh, get in the states. So now, finally, you might think that perhaps the delta functions are going to give me trouble. And you can try to regularize this problem a little bit. Put some smoother functions here, depending on some cutoff, with the, with the understanding that at the end we take our functions back to delta functions. Okay. So at this point, uh, this is a very nice object. It's a nice Gaussian path integral. It has a quadratic part in X and a linear part. Right? So we know how to do Gaussian integrals. So we know that this integral is going to give us something like uh, so the inverse a here was sort of the kinetic term of the of the scalar field. So one over a is the propagator for the scalar field. So here you get something like this. So now, does, is, is this expression going to work uh, when I take 
my limit back to delta functions. So and so, I mean, the mixed terms where I'm looking at different operators will surely be fine. This will become just g of z, i, z, j. No problem there. The diagonal terms will be a bit troublesome because they give me something like g of z, i, z, i, except that the two-point function of the scalar field is a logarithmic singularity in the points coincide. So I have some troublesome terms that look like uh, this. So in order to regularize these troublesome terms, I had to add a counter term. So I'm going to say that the real way to define this operator is not just to insert this linear term, but also a constant term. As usual, I'm not being precise with uh, factors of 10, it's a factors of 5, factors of 2, factors of minus 1. Uh, but you, these are all expressions you can find around on references, you know, textbook notes. So this correction removes the short distance singularity of the operator. So this is now a perfectly fine exp finite expression as the same f to delta functions. So that's the way you define these operators in the context of a path integral. Now, this, this definition has some entertaining consequence uh, because, as you can guess, this regula regulator depends on my coordinate system. So if I, if I change my coordinates, if I do a, the usual holomorphic change of coordinate, This will change. And so the definition of my operator will change by an overall rescaling. Now, here I'm doing everything in conformal gauge. So implicitly, I have a flat matrix and work with holomorphic coordinates. If you prefer to work with generic matrix and think in terms of wild transformations, here you're going to put the, the metric distance along between the two points. Mm -hmm. So the version here appears as a Green function in two details. Yes. Boundary conditions, which is for open boundary conditions, right? No. When your Green's function depends on the boundary conditions. And the, the slower root is the singularity of the, of the green, green function, function. where the two points coincide. Okay. So it doesn't matter what's going on far away. Indeed, if I'm exactly on the plane, this is exactly the Green function. And it cancels out these diagonal terms completely. So this means that if you, if you change your coordinate, and then you do the proper wild transformation to go back to, flat, to a flat matrix, your regulator changes by something like this. This is a simple calculation. So the funny thing is that when we're redefining, regularizing things like the stress tensor, 
which are polynomial in the fields, the changes in the, renom the renormalization ended up in giving us e extra additive terms when we change coordinates. But here, because everything is exponentiated, the correction when you change coordinates is also exponentiated. In other words, the operator defined with some coordinate system and the one defined in some other coordinate system differ by a pretty amusing power of the Jacobian. So you should compare this with the transformation law of, say, d, dx. So, so this operator behaves like it has some funny power or some uh, uh, indices. Uh, to say is that this operator has, a, has an anomalous dimension, meaning under the scaling of your local coordinate system, it gets multiplied by a funny factor. So it's entertaining that even if you are in a free, free field theory, uh, this fun, these exponential operators manage to have an anomalous dimension. Hmm? Why is it to the p squared, not just to the p? Doesn't that, the two in that uh, squared cancel with the two? Oh, piece by that. Comes here, and she comes here. Yeah. Because we're regularizing uh, this, the diagonal parts of that. And the fact these vertex operators have anomalous dimensions is actually the reason that uh, you can have fun things like bosonization, which you might encounter at some point, uh, I hope, uh, which relate theories of uh, look kind of trivial, like a free boson, to theories which have, like the Ising model, which have interesting operators with trivial anomalous dimension. So you can actually describe a whole lot of uh, non-trivial uh, two-dimensional conformal field theories as free bosons, or variations of free bosons. Uh, Now, okay, so this was all done with a path integral. Uh, let's see what we do on the cylinder instead. Now, on the cylinder, we need to give, a, to give a meaning to an expression like this, where this x now is, a, is, a, is an operator, is this sum of x, p, a, n, a minus n, sums of operators which don't commute. Actually, sorry, before we go there, uh, let's, get the, let's get the answer. Uh, yeah. So after we regular, let's, let's see what is the correlation function on the plane of a bunch of these vertex operators. So the green function is just a log. This counter term cancels out all the unwanted, all the, all the diagonal terms. So to get is sort of a product over pairs of operators uh, or something like this. Just make sure that I got the. Uh, I think so. Okay. I'm trying to remember if I got it right or if there was a true here. Uh, I think. Uh, I think this was it. Yes. That's a kind of a neat expression. 
And of course, with a bit more patience, one can compute more complicated things with you know, whatever insertions of x you want, still by doing the sort, same sort of Gaussian integral. Now, let's try to do things on the cylinder. in the set coordinate or in the field. So there's, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Right, right. But uh, what does it mean set I minus set J on the others? Okay. Expectation value of only one of these? Mm -hmm. I, I would get. Uh, no. Uh, on the plane, mm -hmm. there is what you can always have implicitly some momentum uh, going to infinity. Uh, so here I was. I think, yeah, the one point function is actually one. When we look at the sphere, indeed, we'll. Uh, so, Let me start by looking at some toy model. Suppose I'm given this sort of exponent, exponent, and I want to normal order it, meaning I want to really uh, separate the modes that kill the vacuum on one side and the ones that kill the vacuum on the other side for ease of calculations, if you want. So I claim that this formula holds. I hope that my alphas and my a's are distinguishable. So alphas are just numbers. Okay. On the other hand, the a's are operators. So I claim that this is true. There are various ways you can try to prove this. You can just expand the left-hand side and expand the right-hand side and play around the combinatorics. Uh, you can try to write a differential equation in alpha 1. Uh, uh, okay. See, for example, let's look at just the first non-trivial part of the calculation. On one side, I might have 1 and a half of alpha 1, 1 plus alpha minus 1, a minus 1 squared. Okay. So you expand it, you'll find 1 half alpha 1, a1 squared, 1 half alpha minus 1, a minus 1 squared, which are going to come from these exponents. And you also find alpha 1, alpha minus 1 times a1, a minus 1. plus a minus 1, a1. Then you can use your commutation relations to write it in an order way. Uh, sorry, it was a half here. And then 
a number. So you should recognize the expansion on the right hand side, the second order in alphas. Okay. This generalizes in an obvious fashion. to this. I hope this is clear. OK, so now let's try to make sense of an expression like that in terms of operators. Uh, again, let me regularize it exact, exactly the way I did it there. So let me try to make sense of an operator like this. it out a little bit. So these, uh, these alphas are going to be roughly the Fourier coefficients of this f. Uh, let's decompose x into the zero mode, the momentum, and the parts that contain the positive and negative modes. So, for example, if you remember the expressions I brought in the first lecture, in the second lecture, I guess not like that. Okay, so when I normal order it. I'm going to, well, I had to deal with the, uh, I'll deal with, with this uh, later. Okay, so I get roughly something like that. And now I can apply this sort of formula. And uh, try to figure out how does this look like? How does this contribution look like? This is the only thing I have really had to, to worry about. Because you know, after I after I regularize this, these guys and these guys will just behave per per perfectly well if I make my f back into delta function. So, if you just evaluate this, you get precisely uh, so. So to regularize this, I need to evaluate what happens if I consider this okay. then this guy is going to be integrated against f and this guy is going to be integrated against uh, f but let me just look at that for a moment so I get something like e to the minus square over 2, sum over positive n, 1 over n, e to the n s prime minus s, as complex conjugate, times the normal order of exponentials. Okay. 
And this is exactly the same log that we had there. So this gives me, uh, this is nothing else than p squared over two log of one minus e to the s minus s prime, uh, s prime minus s so squared. So this is uh, exactly the kind of term that can be regulated by a log of s minus s prime squared. So if I regulate this operator exactly the same way as I regulated on the other board, uh, I can get to a final answer. This is a, what's called a normal order exponential. And uh, it's uh, usually sort of fun to play around with these things, see what happens if you multiply them, commute them, and so on. Uh, but usually it's more labor laborious to do things like this than to do them with passing integrals. Uh, but now, now that I have this definition, it becomes easy to show <coughs> the desired result. So this verifies that the vertex operators on the plane with momentum p are related by the state operator map to the state of momentum p on the cylinder. So this would be invaluable in, as I mentioned yesterday, this would be invaluable in computing string theory scattering amplitudes. Because it means that whenever, whenever I have these sort of tubes that come in and want to join some more complicated picture, I can always do a wild transformation and smoothen out the tube. At the price of putting a vertex operator there. So if you do that to all the tubes, you reduce your problem of uh, computing the scattering amplitude to the problem of computing the correlation function on the sphere of a bunch of these vertex operators. Okay. And then you use that formula. You get your answer. Now, as I mentioned, the, the sphere, uh, let's see the most, the simplest exa possible example of calculation which might involve a sphere. Let me start with the cylinder. With the usual flat metric. And then well, let me do a wild transformation, which uh, blows up on both ends of the cylinder, as opposed to the wild transformation which we did on the, to go to the plane, which blew up only at one end of the cylinder. So I'm going to divide this by uh, 
this wall factor. So this is, this is going to collapse both ends of the cylinder to something smooth. If I use the usual expo exponential map, I can write my, my, my matrix like that. Which is the metric on the sphere in stereographic coordinates, the smooth round metric. So I claim that this well transformation relates the cylinder to the sphere. Okay. So in this coordinate system, so this coordinate system is sort of like a plane. It's like a projection of the sphere onto a plane. So Roughly z equal to zero at the north pole, and z goes to infinity at the south pole. On the other hand, if you define a second coordinate z to the minus s, z tilde would be zero at the south pole, and z it would be infinity at the north pole. So this is a standard way to describe the sphere as a complex manifold. You take two, two patches, each looks like uh, a plane, and then you glue them together by an equation like that. So in each of the two patches, if you want to, you can put a conformally, you can put a flat matrix by, by wild transformation. And then there is a wild rescaling when you go from one, from one to the other. So this means that when you do correlation functions on the sphere, they will usually look very similar to correlation functions on the, on the plane. The only extra information that there is when you work with the sphere is that you get to specify operators placed at infinity in the plane. So here the precise correspondence is that if, you, if I put some state v1 in the past and v2 in the, in the future, On the sphere, I get an insertion of the corresponding operators related by the state operator map. Locally, the correspondence between the cylinder and the sphere near the south pole or the, near the north pole is the same as the one we had with the plane. So these are literally the same operators that you would have put on the plane. But now you get one at the north pole and one at the south pole. So at the level of vertex operators, there is not very much to, to say, more than what we already said. Uh, the only possible remark is that on the cylinder, uh, there was an interesting constraint on the momenta of these vertex operators. So if I try to study some correlation function, some momentum in the past, a bunch of vertex operators and then some sorry some momentum in the future a bunch of vertex operators and some momentum in the past because of the conservation of momentum because the translations of the scalar field are asymmetric this is a big delta function. Uh, okay. Now, when you go to the sphere, both this state and this state will give you possibly vertex operators. Corresponding statement of the sphere is that if you are on the sphere, you have a product of uh, then 
this gives you a big delta function. And then you get your product of uh, pi minus pj uh, to the pi dot pj. So if you want to think about the sphere and work on the plane, the prescription is that putting an operator at infinity on the sphere uh, is the same as uh, putting at some finite distance and then sending it to infinity, except you need to account for the coordinate transformation between infinity and, uh, and zero. So you get something like z to the twice uh, it's called the scaling dimension of the operator. The scaling dimension of the operator is simply the sort of power of the Jacobian that appears when you change coordinates. Now we've seen several examples of this formula. Uh, I'm sorry, I never mentioned the, the conformal dimension yet. Well, we didn't, didn't need, now I'm going to start mentioning it. So, for example, so there are these two numbers, uh, delta and delta bar. Sometimes they're also denoted as h and h bar. Okay. So they tell you how the operator changes when you change coordinates. If you For example, the first derivative of x over there might have delta equal to 1, delta bar equal to 0. Uh, the vector operator over there had both delta and delta bar equal to p squared over 2. So the meaning of delta is that delta plus delta bar is the scaling dimension. I scale my space time, the operator gets multiplied by the change in the scale to the delta plus delta bar. On the other hand, delta minus delta bar control the behavior of the operator under rotations. Suppose I do z goes to e to the i alpha z. I get opposite factors from z and z bar. This is the spin of the operator. Also, if you have a state to operator map, so if you have some state related to some operator, <coughs> because, let me see if I have the right picture. No, it's, up, it's up there. Uh, because time translations become scale transformations in the plane. And Translations in space become rotations in the plane. Uh, the spin is the same as the momentum, space, space momentum. And the scaling dimension. The operator is the same as the energy of the state, well, up to the Casimir energy. Or more precisely, delta goes to L0 at the at L0 eigenvalue, and delta bar goes to the L0 bar eigenvalue. So, for example, you know that the, the momentum had 
eigenvalues p square over two, both for L0 and L0 bar. And we saw that the vertex operator had the delta, well, a delta bar both equal to p square over two. Similarly, del x was related to a minus one acting on the vacuum. And a minus one raises L and not by one. Actually, not going to be using this formula. I just mentioned it for uh, whatever for reference. Uh, I just keep my operators away from the north pole anyway, from the south pole. But uh, right, when you start studying conformity theory, I hope this 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 these things will come out useful. So right. So as I was mentioning, right, and then the way to understand why do I get the delta function? If you want, I'm studying this free boson on the sphere. Uh, I'm doing a path integral for the free boson on the sphere. In particular, there is an integral over the zero mode of this, uh, of this scalar field. And this imposes current conservation. You know, if you have e to the i x times something, and that something is non-zero, if you enter it over x, you get zero. Mm -hmm. If it is a, what's called a primary, in a sense, this is the definition of a class of operators, which are called primaries. Some, opera some other operators might not, might have more complicated transformations. So the ones that really under, are primary. That's right. The stress tensor already is different from this. The stress tensor had an extra term proportional to C over 12 and the Schwartz and derivative of uh, this back to the field. And there is another example of something that transforms not quite like that, which is the ghost number current. Well, you check how you define your operator in different coordinate systems, and you compare the two definitions. That's right. Well, so x itself, in a sense, uh, right, so x itself does not transform when you change your coordinates. That x is a, is its first derivative, so it just transforms by the chain rule. Composite operators need regularization, so have the potential to transform in a more interesting way, because the regulator might not transform well under your, uh, might not be invariant under your coordinate transformations. Now, I stated everything here in terms of coordinate transformations. There is an alternative language, which is to think in terms of while the scaling. So, uh, But if you want to sort of use the, the power of complex analysis, uh, these, are, these are the sort of formula which come out to be very useful. Now, I think in one of the tutorials today, I think, you're going to study something called OPE, operator quantum expansion, uh, which is a way to just use uh, complex analysis as much as possible instead of using uh, complicated operator identities. Uh, so you can get actually a lot of these results right away without going to a path integral, without going uh, to commutation relations of, uh, of operators. Uh, okay. Looks like we still have 10 minutes. Um, so, right, so for the free scalar on the sphere, I told you as much as much as all, all that you need to know. 
you give you a correlation function, so you can add some extra derivatives of x, whatever you want. You make sure that you have moment of conservation, and then you do your calculations on the plane. For the boat, for the ghosts systems, things are also quite straightforward, just for one little subtlety. Uh, so as I, as I mentioned in the previous lectures, the ghost number current is anomalous, which means when you do an, uh, a, a wild transformation, it, it shifts the, the charge, the definition of charge shift, of ghost number charge shifts. Uh, another way to say it is that there is some, the conservation law for the ghost number current. It's a bit damaged. It's not zero. It's something like three or maybe three halves. I don't remember. Times the curvature of your space. So as you can see, on a sphere, it's definitely going to be damaged. On the plane, it's going to be fine. So when you look at correlation functions of, uh, of ghosts on your sphere, an expression that you were thought would give zero because of current conservation right, would give you non-zero, uh, or vice versa. More precisely, on the cylinder, on the plane, uh, or, in any, or in a situation in which the ghost number current was conserved, I would essentially expect that if I have the same number of Bs and Cs, I get non-zero. If I have more Bs than Cs, or more Cs than Bs, I'll have zero. It's because it would be exactly like having a, uh, well, on, on the, but on the, because of this condition, what actually happens is that on the sphere, uh, you get things that are non-zero if you have three more Cs than Bs. Now, uh, this might sound somewhat confusing, uh, but if we just start from calculations we understood on the cylinder and then go to the sphere, uh, everything will be, I hope, clear. So. So if you remember, on the cylinder, we went through a certain set of interesting states for the, for the system of ghosts. There was a ground state, and another ground state. And then there was another state we found interesting, because it was BSP invariant. So and we, we said that the ground state can be written as C1. G, that a ground state can be written as C0, C1, G, sorry, 0. And then by symmetry, you can imagine there is another state uh, uh, third state that can be interesting. Let me call it zero tilde. Okay. So this state was annihilated by b, b minus one, b zero, b one, etc. It was annihilated by c two, c three, etc. Now this guy is now annihilated by C1 because C1 squared is zero. It's not annihilated by B minus one. So C0, C1, etc. G, C0, C1, C2, etc. Kill G. And so on. This other G tilde, G prime, was killed by B1, B2, etc. This was killed by C0, C1. And finally, this guy is killed by, by 
v minus v2, v3, and so on. And this and if you by c minus one, c zero, c one, etc. And the Gauss, we computed the Gauss numbers of the states, and the result was kind of neat and symmetric. This is the Gauss number minus three half, minus one half, one half, three halves. And finally, you can convince yourself that this sort of expression is the only expression that can be non zero. So if you want states to be to have a non-zero non in a product, you essentially want them to be killed by complementary sets of operators. So because zero is killed by these ones, the dual state will have to be killed by b minus two, b minus three, b minus four, b minus five, and by c one, c zero, c minus one, etc., which are the dual conditions uh, to this state. So uh, this is the sort of the inner product, which is not zero. Also, it makes sense from the point of view of Gauss number. Gauss number is conserved on the on the cylinder. Let's let's write explicit what. There's not a convenient way to write this. Reason. Now, why, this, why is this important? I'm going to make a claim, and then we're going to check it. I'm claiming that the state operator map relates zero to the insertion of the identity operator. So if you want to put no operators on the plane, you've got to put that vacuum uh, in the past. And one way to verify it is to go back to the two-point function, which we computed, well, we computed, which uh, I told you can be <laughs> readily computed at some point, and perhaps some of you computed. Okay. Now, the exponential map, if you look at the dimension, conformal dimensions of C and B, uh, so C actually has dimension minus one. And B has dimension two. It kind of makes sense because the dimension of the stress tensor is also two. It's, you know, dx, dx, things like that. And you want the BST symmetry relates T and B. Another way to think about it is C was a vector field and B was a true form, but not true form, a symmetric tensor with two lowercase indices. So if you do your exponential map, C on the plane is going to be e to the S C on the cylinder and be on the plane, it's going to be to the minus s, 2s, t on the cylinder. And so you see that this implies that z o tilde cz dz t o is 1 over d minus d prime. And this is the two point function of the Gauss system on the plane. So you can check the good definition of the Gauss action. You do the part integral on the Gauss on the plane, and you get this answer. Very simple. OK, sorry, I'll have a couple more minutes. So, so this shows you, these and similar calculations can show you, convince you, hopefully, that this is the state that corresponds to put uh, nothing. And the same is true for putting nothing at the south pole of the sphere. 
So this shows you that when you work on the sphere, you got to have three Cs to get a non-zero result. The starting from this is easy to show. the correlation function uh, which is the same as the correlation function of C on the sphere Essentially, you, you look at this, you expand them in modes, and you pick up all the possible combinations of C minus 1, C0, C1. There are six of them, and they're the six terms of this product. OK. This is all the. <laughs> All the, all the information about ghosts that we'll actually ever need to compute scattering amplitudes. Uh, the fact that the triple function of C's, of three C's on the sphere, is that. Uh, sorry, I have this bad habit. I completely, I, I behave like the all anthelomorphic ghosts do not exist. Uh, it's, it's not a very good habit. What I really mean is that. You know, there is a, I need to have three ghosts, three Cs, and three C bars to have something on zero on the sphere. I'm sorry. Okay. So this was really supposed to be something like that. Sorry. Okay. And actually, I. I can't resist computing a, a triple function, a, a scattering amplitude of three tachyons. We have all that we needed, so let's just do it. It will take one minute. So I want to study a process in which one tachyon decays to two tachyons. So one tachyon is coming to the past in some momentum mode uh, one. And it's going out to the future okay, into two tachyons. Let me just use a convention in which all momenta are uh, ingoing. So I have the one going this way, the two going in here, and the three going in here. Now, is this kinematically possible? Sure, this is a tachyon. Uh, the momenta are space-like. There is no problem having three space-like momenta which add to zero. Okay, I can draw them on the board. So this amplitude has a chance to be non-zero. So how do we compute it? Well, first, so remember the, the tachyon state Look like that. This was the Q exact, Q closed state in the cohomology of P squared equal to two. I want to use the state operator map to convert this state into an insertion. So I'm going to map this picture to this picture. So I'm going to insert and. I need to use the state operator map for this. And this becomes simply that. Uh, C C bar e to the i t dot x. More explicit, this is really a p mu x mu, OK? So here I have three, a sphere with three operator insertions. C 
c bar e to the i c1 x evaluated at c1 say let me call this point z1 c2 c3 i have c c bar to the i p2 x inserted at z2 and c c bar e to the i p3 x inserted at z3 okay so let's compute it we know that the c's are going to give us z1 minus z2 squared z2 minus z3 squared z1 minus z3 squared I know that the moment vertex operators are going to give me the expression up to there. Uh, what, where is it? Well, under the blackboard. Sorry. Yes. So I get z1 minus z2 to the 2 z1 dot p2. C1 minus Z3, so 2, C1 dot P3, Z2 minus Z3, so the 2, P2 dot P3. Okay? Times conservation of the momentum. Now, momentum conservation means that, say, P1 squared, which is equal to 2, is also equal to minus p2 minus p3 squared, which is equal to 2 plus 2 plus 2 p2 dot p3, which means this is minus 2, this is minus 2, this is minus 2. So 2 minus 2, 2 minus 2, 2 minus 2, the answer is just 1. Well, it's a delta function of the momentum. So there is no dependence left on where did I place these points. You might wonder why. The point is that actually you can completely gauge fix the position of the points, meaning you can always file a, a wild transformation which maps this same picture, this picture, to this for whatever position of the points you want. And the way to understand it is that you can always do a coordinate transformation which is holomorphic, will define everywhere, and maps the sphere to itself and moves these points wherever you want. So if we did our gauge fixing properly, the answer better not depend on our gauge fixing. And so you see that the ghosts and the matter fields are cooperating together exactly to kill the dependence on the gauge fixing. So the choice of position of these points, the ones that choose the three, was part of my gauge fixing. The answer should be independent of the gauge fixing. So it better cancel out. And it does. OK, so from this, we just learned something. I don't know if it's interesting or not, that uh, this process happens. <laughs> uh, the tachyon can decay into two tachyons. Now, you can try to, there, there is not much fun to have with uh, processes of involving only three particles because usually decays are not kinematically very interesting. For example, to want to have two tachyons going to one tachyon in, in Lorentzian signature doesn't work very well. Sorry, one, two gravitons going to one graviton maybe it's not working very well. But you could, in principle, look at other processes uh, like that. Um, well, is it possible to have a, I guess it should be possible to have a tachyon scattering uh, of the graviton. Can you do it on shell? Uh, yes, right. I could have a, a graviton scatter off a tachyon at rest. So perhaps as an exercise, try to do that. 
try to see what happens if you scatter a graviton off. If you, well, not really scatter off. Try to see if you can compute this process uh, in string theory. No, 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 it's part, it's really part of the, of the, of the scalar fields correlation function. So the a correlation function of the scalar field, the sphere, has a delta function. This is not like PRC where you have to worry about the kinematics in the first place and then worry about 